should be our desire to be nearer to Him today, this morning, this afternoon than we were before we came. And that's my heart. And thank you for that a challenge from God's Word in song. Turn to the book of Titus chapter 3, if you would. Uh, the book of Titus chapter 3. I want to talk to you this morning about a godly citizen. Strangely enough, as Paul is writing to Titus at about, about a very sensitive but yet appropriate subject in these days in which we live, he's telling him how to be, I believe, a godly citizen. Now we have a number of points that we cover, but I'm just going to focus on the first two verses of chapter 3 as Paul is telling us how to be a godly citizen even though we are citizens of another world. We may be citizens of this world, of this country, but Paul said our citizenship is in heaven. John Phillips said, By nature and cultural background, the Cretans were rebellious and hostile toward authority. The Christian Cretans must learn to recognize governmental authority, although at that time the Roman Empire ruled the world and was under con the control of Nero, one of the most wicked tyrants of all time. So listen to what Paul said to Titus, to the Cretan believers in that first century in verse 1 and 2. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, we may think sometimes that our politicians are bad, but none are as bad as Nero was in that first century. Morally, he was an evil, corrupt, ungodly man. He murdered not one, but two of his wives. He murdered his own mother. He married a man and dressed as a woman in the ceremony. Some historians say he had a part in starting the fire in July of A.D. 64 and then blamed it on the Christians. And then he would proceed to burn them at the stake, torture, and feed them to the lions. It was probably during his reign that the Apostle Paul and Peter were martyred. He died of suicide in 68 A.D. The Christians would not participate in the emperor worship or the pagan idol worship. It was with this backdrop that Paul gives some guidelines to the Christians at Crete about how to relate to government authority, which he calls principalities, powers, and magistrates. And I want to share with you in these short two little verses that Paul, I believe, gives to Titus six guidelines for how you and I, and even them back then under Nero, could be godly citizens of this world. The first one we find is a word that's often difficult to deal with. A godly citizen will be subject to authority. Paul says to Titus, put them in mind to be subject. Now, that word subject that Paul uses is a military word. It means to be subordinate. Those in the military understand this word because you're under authority. People often ask me, were you a veteran? I said, no, but I was born in the Army. Uh, my dad was in the Army. I was born at uh, Martin Army Hospital at Fort Benning, Georgia. 
And I remember growing up in Columbus, Georgia, and I loved to go uh, to the base there. Of course, I don't remember <laughs> when I was born and all the other times, but we moved back to Columbus. And uh, in fact, we had a ministry in Columbus sometime later. And I had uh, captains that were my bus drivers. And I had one fellow, he was a black drill sergeant. And uh, he was a godly man, loved the Lord. And uh, one Sunday he showed up with 60 recruits on a bus. And uh, me and another man were standing there one Sunday. He pulls up in this big church bus, about twice the size of one we got. And uh, these young fellows come bouncing out of that bus. And he's standing there, hut, 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 hut. And uh, they're lining up as they get off the bus. You know, I was thinking they'd come meandering off the bus, you know, like bus kids or something, just going there which way. No, I mean, he marched them off the bus. And uh, these young fellows who's got skint heads are in boot camp. And I kind of punched the, the guy next to me, the, the other guy, and I says, can he do that on Sunday? I said, I didn't know if he could do that on Sunday or not, you know. But he, sure enough, those fellas, they lined them right up. And they got off that bus and they kind of uh, filed into to, uh, the youth room. We, we had the youth room available for them and we gave them the gospel in Sunday school and in church and a number of them got saved uh, that Sunday. What a blessing. But if you're in the military, you understand the word subjection. It doesn't mean inferiority. It's not a bad word. In fact, it, it means, according to Strong's, to be put in subjection. Submit self unto. And Paul is telling Titus, listen, we must submit ourselves to the principalities and powers. We may not like them and may not like some of the laws and rules and things that are going on. Again, Paul would reiterate this truth in Romans chapter 13 as he deals with authority. And I'm not going to take the whole time to deal with this particular subject. But listen to how Paul describes the purpose of government. The purpose of government. Let every soul be subject, there's our word, unto higher powers. For there's no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Now, tonight, we're going to speak about Acts chapter 5. And uh, it's called a jailbreak. Uh, the angels help the disciples break out of jail. What does that fit into authority? Well, uh, we're going to find out tonight. But remember, there are three institutions that God has ordained. The first one is the family. The second one is government, and the third one is the fam I mean, is the church. So uh, the word subjection fits into all of those areas, and we'll do more of that tonight. I was just sticking that in for, for this evening for you to come back. But whoso therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. For they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, you should be afraid. Why? For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. And when any authority doesn't fulfill its responsibility that God has ordained it, whether it be the government, whether it be the family, or whether it be the church, you have nothing but chaos. Chaos. That's true in any of these uh, ordained institutions of God. Again, Paul is saying the basic purpose of government is to protect and punish, not to provide. When Samuel Sherwood stood in the pulpit of the Fairfield, Connecticut church on August the 31st, my birthday, 1774, to preach a sermon 
scriptural instructions to civil rulers and all freeborn subjects. He read for his text 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 3. Here was his text, Samuel Sherwood. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. If governments would do that, whether it be local, state, or, or federal government, oh, listen, God has ordained government. It doesn't mean that uh, submission is all-inclusive. Many a soldier has used the excuse for doing wrong, I was just following orders. In fact, in Ephesians 5.22, Paul uses the same word in the home when he says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Remember what Peter said, we'll preach that tonight, Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than men. So a good godly citizen is one that is subject to authority. But notice what else he says, a godly citizen will obey authority. Obey authority. Listen to what he says in the next phrase. To obey magistrates. To obey. One commentator said, expresses the general conformity to the regulations of the civil authorities. To obey magistrates. That is to obey them in all that was not contrary to the word of God, says Barnes. Again, Adam Clark said this, For such advice as that given here, known character of the Cretans, is a sufficient reason. They were ever liars, wild beasts, and sluggish gluttons. In other words, drunkards. Such persons would feel like little disposition to submit to the wholesome restraints of the law, you see, they have been saved now, but sometimes old habits are hard to break. And their old habits and their old way of life and their evil ways uh, toward authority. In fact, in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, the writer of Hebrews tells us this, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Many commentators believe the context of the writer of Hebrews in this verse is the church. Now remember, there's three institutions and in each one of these institutions, the principle of, of authority rules or subjection. And the implication is, the understanding of that is because his very next statement, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. And what does the church do? Watching over the souls of men. You see, the most important thing that you need today is not to submit to man's authority. The most important need that you have in your life is submit to God's authority. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And to realize that we were rebellious sinners. We were enemies of God. And the Bible says God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Your greatest need is submit to God and say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. And Lord, I need a Savior. That's why God came to this world, that He died for sinners. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gained the whole world? The richest man in all the world, if he dies and goes to hell, oh, listen, what has he gained? He's gained nothing. So the most important need that you have is submit to the authority of your soul, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know Him today? Do you know Him and trust Him as your Savior? You can do that today. But you see, a, a godly citizen will obey the authorities in his life. 
A, a godly young people, a young person will obey his parents. A, a godly citizen will obey the authorities. You may not like the speed limit out here in front of the church and school, but you know what? A, a godly person will obey uh, those uh, authorities. And again, what did you say? A godly citizen will demonstrate good works. Good works. Again, notice, I, I like how he describes it. He says, to be ready to every good work. Now, we're not saved by works. We know the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Yet that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But remember what Jesus said? Let your, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Listen to what Paul said to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Beautiful verse. For God is able to make grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. Isn't that wonderful? That as children of God, we have all sufficiency in all things. In other words, we've got everything that we need. God's grace to help us through a pandemic, to help us through this wicked world. We're not citizens of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. But while we're here, we must demonstrate, what does he say? May abound to every good work. You see, in his other pastoral epistle to uh, Timothy, listen to what he says in 2 Timothy 2, 21. If any man therefore purge himself from these, he shall, shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto good work. He says it again in chapter 3 and verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect. And the word perfect there implies spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. A mature young person, a mature adult, a mature godly person will demonstrate good works as a citizen. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Warren Wiersbe said this, cooperation in those matters that involve the whole community. Our heavenly citizenship does not absolve us from responsibilities as citizens on earth. John Phillips said Christians should support all efforts of those in power to improve the lot of people. Christians should be in the forefront of those who minister to the poor, the sick, the handicapped, the dis disadvantaged, and the enslaved. He went on to say missionaries to uncivilized tribes have traditionally boosted evangelism by accompanying it with hospitals, schools to minister to the body and mind as well to the soul. As you know, as we often read the letters from Dr. Johnson in Cambodia, he's been, on, he's been put on the board in the, in the country of Cambodia in the uh, pandemic as one of the health, top health officials. And what a blessing it is oftentimes to read his letters about how he would have this clinic, these clinics all over Cambodia. And they, the poor, the, the sick, and all the people would come and, and they would give them medicine and treatment and give them the good news of the gospel. And many coming with COVID and the COVID treatments that he's applying, he's cut the death rate, and he said this a number of months ago in Cambodia, in half. I told my wife he needs to replace Dr. Fauci. We read letters from Ricky Martin in the Philippines. How that he's dis uh, distributing uh, food to needy families and along with that food comes a presentation of the gospel and all the things that he does. What? Uh, godly people reaching out to the community, making an impact for God. And I can say that for our church as well. What a blessing to know that our church here in Chillicothe is reaching out as a testimony to this community. 
As I look forward every year to hearing their reports uh, that our ministry leaders share and the outreach and the effect they have on the community, on this church, and yea, around the world. Even realizing that our young people in this past year have helped in the nursing home and helped the elderly. They've adopted the shut-ins and gifts to encourage them. They've worked here, yes, around the church, uh, serving and helping, helping in the bus ministry, reaching and giving the gospel and boys and girls to come uh, on the bus and caroling and passing out flyers uh, for our revival. There, there's so many things that they've done. And uh, even with our children's church, uh, I know Brother Dave has some wonderful things to share of the outreach of the boys and girls of our children's church. And uh, I believe we got a letter of, of a thank you from one of the shut-ins and one of the people that sent a thank you to our church uh, to say, thank you for reaching out to me. A lonely individual, often people that never go to visit, family members, the community have forgotten and are afraid. But we've reached out as a church. And I could say that about our school as well. A few years ago, as you know, we started our Project Serve in, in our school. And it's been hard to get away from it. As we have been serving and helping in the community and helping uh, uh, in this town and, uh, and around uh, this area uh, to see our young people out serving the community. And what a blessing it was when you drive by the pump houses over there uh, in the middle of town and you can see those painted pump houses and know that the kids from our school had a part in that. And we got a, a letter from the mayor of Chillicothe saying thank you for your service to our community. The cards that were sent to six nursing homes, the police department, and the shut-ins. And as we reached out to the Empower Life Center, the baby drive, as we gave outfits and formula and blankets and diapers. And I do have a letter that was sent to our school. Dear students of Calvary Baptist Academy, thank you so much. And, and I can hardly read this writing because I, I know it's an elderly lady that's writing it. For the Christmas stocking and the cookies and uh, I have enjoyed it uh, very much. Uh, and the design on the front of it was really pretty. Excuse the printing. I'm 80 years old. And my husband has gone on, I think she says, 15 years. I miss him very much. Once again, thanks for the card. That's good works. That's reaching out to the community. And I could go on to the veterans' homes and the nursing homes and the people through this pandemic have, have been very hard to minister to, to. And as a pastor, I said, Lord, we've got to continue to give the gospel. We've got to continue to, to do good works. Oh, again, it's important to realize the need as we reach out to the community with these uh, good deeds. Not only good works, but good words. A godly citizen will demonstrate good words. Not only good works, but good words. He said to speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers, uh, but gentle. You see, it is evident that Christians should speak should not speak evil of each other or even those in authority. Christians should shun the widespread tendency of people to attack ru rulers verbally. Again, one commentator said, to refrain from slander requires considerable grace. Warren Wiersbe said the believer should not have a bad attitude toward the government and show it by slanderous accusations. Would you remember that Jesus Christ himself stood before the high priest, Herod, and Pilate. And in every occasion, Jesus was respectful to these evil and ungodly men. 
In fact, another occasion, just to look at it briefly, in Acts chapter 23, uh, in this incident, many believe that uh, we can take from this incident that one of Paul's problems, uh, his thorn in the flesh, many commentators say, was his poor eyesight. His poor eyesight. And they allude to this occasion uh, in Acts chapter 23 when he speaks disrespectful to the high priest and then doesn't realize it and apologizes for it. L listen, uh, Acts chapter 23 in verse 2. And the high priest Ananias commanded him that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. And then Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou white wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. In other words, he was smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, Revile us, thou God's high priest. Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now, as he was standing right there by him, why didn't he recognize it was the high priest? And some said it was maybe because of his poor eyesight. You know, whether it be our governor or whether it be our, our president, whoever it is, a person in authority, if they were to walk into this service as, as pastor and as Christians, we should show them the most godly respect uh, because they represent the authorities in our life. And you know what? That principle should follow down through every aspect of leadership, whether it be in the home. Show respect to your parents, to those in authority, whether it be in the church, to show respect to those in authority. And it doesn't mean that we always agree or maybe not even like the pastor. We may not even have ungodly parents, but we're to show them respect to the authorities in our lives. Be careful. A godly citizen is gentle towards authority. Listen to what Paul, how he describes our or he's speaking to the Cretans, you remember? Not brawlers. Now what in the world does that mean? It sounds like a wild west fight in a, in a bar. Not to be brawlers, you know. No, that's not what he, he means at all. In fact, the word does imply not fighting. It implies uh, not contentious. What is interesting is Paul uses this word of a pastor. He's not to be a brawler. He's not to be a contentious person. You ever notice people that you, you bring up certain subject or certain things and they always want to fight about something? Well, that shouldn't be our attitude even toward authority. Again, John Phillips said, no doubt his choice of words is a reflection on the belligerent Cretan character. Yeah. We can be bold. But it doesn't mean we should be rude. A contentious person. The word implies, one commentator said, not attacking others, not to be contentious. And sometimes folks are rude and arrogant, and this is not the Christian manner. Then he uses the word, I'm talking about a godly citizen is gentle. He's not contentious, but he is gentle. The word gentle, according to Jameson Fawcett Brown, says, toward those who attack us, yielding, considerate, not urging one's rights to the uttermost, but forbearing and kind. James, in fact, tells us in James chapter 3 and verse 7 that gentleness is one of the characteristics of a spiritual wise person. Listen to what he says. But wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. 
means, Warren Wiersbe said it means an attitude of moderation and sweet reasonableness. Oh, listen, sometimes authorities may test our patience. They, they may uh, stretch us, but you know what? We must say, Lord, I need a sweet disposition toward those authorities to be a good citizen. And then last, he comes to the last word, is he struck in these rebellious, at one time carnal, drunken, fighting Christians, to be meek. To be meek. Showing all meekness unto all men. Someone has defined it in this way. An inwrought grace of the soul. Again, one commentator said, Meekness is a spiritual disposition that prompts us to bow submissively to the will of God. The same quality of soul will enable us to face our fellow man, including evil men, with patience. In other words, uh, oftentimes when we're dealing with authorities, and they were dealing with some pretty evil authorities in that day, to have a meek disposition. You know what is interesting when you study church history? And go deeper than that. Study Baptist church history. And see the martyrs as they were led to the stakes to be burned. That the testimony of the very men that lit the fires that burned them. And the testimony of the men that were burned at the stake and the people that watched and lit the fires were touched by their response to those ungodly, wicked people that burned them and killed them. We could learn a lesson nowadays. But oftentimes in these days in which we live, we have not seen this attitude toward authority. The Bible says to be submissive. Paul says to Titus and those Christians to be obedient, to demonstrate good works, respect authority. Don't be a brawler or contentious and then be meek. But let me hasten to say that we have freedoms today that the Apostle Paul and Peter did not have in that first century. And we should be thankful. thankful. Thankful that we have freedom of religion. Thankful that we have freedom of speech. Thankful that we live in a democratic republic. That we don't live in a dictator society. We elect our officials. Our mayor, our governor, our president, our senator, and our congressman. And let me go a step closer. Our school board. And if we don't like those in authority, we can march down to the voting booth in our city and vote them out. We have that freedom. We don't like what our congressman is doing. When it comes time, he's supposed to be representing us. We can go down there and vote. We can vote him out. Whether it be our senator, our governor, or even our president. We have those freedoms. And someone said that all is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. We don't live in that first century like Paul did. And we have freedoms. But if we continue to do nothing across America, we will see our freedoms taken away. They'll teach our kids in our government schools what they want them to be taught. The critical race theory, the transgender issue, evolution. There is no God. And, and we'll just sit by and do nothing and don't care. Whether it be in our state, whether it be in our country. But we have the freedoms 
And we need to exercise those freedoms respectfully and as godly as we can. And I believe Paul would say to us today, you didn't have what I had. Why didn't you do something about it? You stood by and did nothing. But how important it is that we be submissive, we be obedient, we practice good works, respect authority, don't be a brawler and contentious and be meek, and we can be thankful for the freedoms that God has enabled us to have in this country. And we need to recognize that we can protect those freedoms as much as we can and not let them be taken away. Would you bow with me in prayer? Authorities. Six truths that will help us be a godly citizen. Praise God for what He has blessed us with. We all have authorities in our lives that sometimes we disagree with, we don't like. But you know what? The Bible says that we're to respect those authorities, submit, to be obedient. And there's a proper way if we want uh, a law changed or request changed. You remember what Daniel said? He requested of the prince of the eunuchs. He respected the authorities and sought a respectful change of the law. And we can do that. But we're going to look tonight... There comes a time, as Peter said, you know what? We ought to obey God rather than man. But that doesn't mean we're rude and contentious and disrespectful to any authority. Whether it be in the home, whether it be in the church, or whether it be in the state. Father, thank you for salvation that's full and free. Thank you that we can be godly citizens even in this day in which we live. It doesn't matter who's president or who's governor or who's mayor. That we can still be godly citizens. Help us, dear Father, in these days in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen.